Assalamu alaikum, my name is Afifa Kawaja and welcome to Crescent International's Global Forum. On June 13th, the New York Times reported that vast deposits of precious metals such as gold, lithium, copper and other minerals were discovered in Afghanistan. What is the significance of these finds? Uh, the, the discovery of these uh, uh, precious metals is uh, extremely important uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one, uh, Afghanistan is an extremely poor country, so if uh, there are these uh, deposits of uh, lithium and gold uh, and copper, uh, the estimates are that uh, these uh, deposits are worth one trillion dollars. Now considering that um, Afghanistan's uh, total uh, gross domestic product at the present time is something like $356 million, so a trillion dollars is a lot of money for Afghanistan. And, uh, but that has uh, more than the deposits that are discovered, uh, it has uh, important international implications. Uh, for instance, today, uh, China has uh, invested something like $4 billion in Afghanistan's copper mines. That means that the Chinese are actually putting money into development projects in Afghanistan. Now the U.S. has spent about a trillion dollars in Afghanistan, but most of this money has gone into military uh, campaigns and military attacks on the Afghan people. So if now we see that there are such vast deposits that have been discovered in Afghanistan, uh, this would probably give an even greater incentive to the Americans to stay in Afghanistan and not leave the country. Mm -hmm. And so it has a very uh, grave implications for the future of Afghanistan and of course if the, the estimates of a trillion dollars of these various uh, precious metals uh, is, is uh, correct then this would far exceed the oil and gas reserves that uh, the Americans want to tap from Central Asia to bring through Afghanistan. So in that sense uh, these, these reports are extremely important and critical. How is the resistance to foreign occupation troops in Afghanistan going on? And do you see any prospects of peace in the near future? According to uh, latest reports, um, the resistance is spreading throughout the country. This is something that the Americans are extremely concerned about. Uh, you know, we are, we are talking now, we are in the middle of June, and uh, although the Americans had planned a massive in, uh, operation in Kandahar province, uh, that has been postponed because there is great resistance from among the people to uh, this operation. And we also saw within the last uh, few weeks, or in fact the last week, uh, that um, at least 30 or so American soldiers have been killed in one week in Afghanistan. That means that the resistance is intensifying. Kabul is under siege, the surrounding provinces um, have been uh, taken over by the Taliban, According to some estimates, uh, the Taliban now in fact have uh, operations in at least 97% of the country. So that means that the resistance is spreading rapidly and uh, more and more people are turning against the foreign occupation forces because uh, Americans and others um, uh, very often they kill civilians, they barge into people's homes in the middle of the night which creates a lot of resentment. So in that sense, um, uh, the Americans themselves act as recruiters for uh, the resistance because of their uh, ill-conceived policies. And the fact that very little economic progress has been made in Afghanistan, that means that more and more people in Afghanistan are joining the resistance. They may not necessarily be Taliban fighters or Taliban supporters, but they feel that the foreign occupation forces are not really helping them, so they want to get rid of them. They want to say to them that you, you should leave our country. It's an interesting point that you bring up in the previous question that you answered. Um, but isn't it a possibility that civil war might break out if the American troops leave Afghanistan? Well, that will really uh, depend on how and under what circumstances uh, the foreign occupation troops um, leave Afghanistan. Uh, if, let's say, uh, and this is something that, that appears uh, more and more likely that um, ultimately the Americans would have to strike a deal with the Taliban and that is what uh, 
the Afghan president Hamid Karzai has been pushing for and you know at the beginning of June there was a loya jirga which means a grand assembly of uh, about 1600 Afghan elders and other leaders etc and they specifically endorsed uh, negotiations with the Taliban uh, if that comes to fruition then that means that uh, there would be a peaceful transition and a peaceful transfer a transfer of power now, if uh, that did not happen, and if the Americans continue to stay and the Taliban were to, for instance, storm Kabul city and um, uh, there is bloody fighting, uh, then, then the chances are that uh, obviously there will be, for a while, there will be certain conflict. But I have um, uh, faith in the Afghan people in the sense that even though they may fight among themselves, but ultimately they come to some kind of an understanding. And so they will be able to resolve their differences and they'll be able to give and take as they have done historically, that they fight amongst themselves and yet they sit down and they talk and discuss and ultimately settle their um, uh, differences through what is called a jirga. So I think the jirga process will once again take over in Afghanistan um, and they would be able to settle their differences. And uh, in any case, I think um, Afghanistan cannot be any worse than it is under foreign occupation troops. So in that sense, it will be a break from all this fighting and mayhem and tragedies that the people of Afghanistan have faced for so long. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and, and I hope that um, our viewers can find um, uh, or would find this information uh, useful to them. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum, my name is Afifa Khawaja and welcome to Crescent International's Global Forum. Israel's attack on the Gaza flotilla has created a lot of controversy throughout the world. Could you give us your understanding on what happened? Well, the Israeli uh, commando attack on the uh, Freedom Flotilla that was uh, heading towards Gaza. First of all, it was a completely illegal act because uh, this attack was perpetrated in international waters. Uh, the attack occurred about uh, 70 miles off the coast of Gaza. So this was totally uh, in international waters. Uh, these people who were um, going to Gaza, they were planning to deliver uh, food, they were planning to deliver um, baby formula milk, they were planning to deliver sugar and other items of uh, household needs uh, which the people of uh, Gaza desperately need. So it was totally uh, humanitarian aid that was being sent. Uh, secondly, Israel's attack was totally unprovoked and uncalled for. Uh, in fact, the United Nations itself has called uh, the siege of Gaza that Israel has imposed as illegal. There was a resolution uh, in January of 2009 in which the United Nations Security Council demanded that Israel should lift the siege. Uh, to give you just a perspective, uh, Gaza needs something like 2200 trucks of uh, various kinds of uh, food and medicines on a daily basis. And right now, Israel is allowing less than 200. So you can see that there is desperate shortage of food. The United Nations itself has said that about 80% of the people in Gaza are uh, dependent on UN handouts for food. That's bad. how bad the situation is. So the Israeli assault on the, this peaceful flotilla in which there were uh, international uh, you know, citizens from different countries, from Ireland, not only just from Turkey, but from Pakistan, from England, from America, from Canada, uh, all over the world. Uh, there were in fact about 35 or 
so countries, uh, citizens represented in this. Uh, so the attack was illegal and then the Israeli um, commandos killed uh, nine or ten of these uh, people uh, in the boats. In fact, autopsy reports have shown that some people were shot at least 30 times. There were cameramen, there were photographers, and so it is, it is really a horrendous crime that Israel has perpetrated. And of course, the Israeli excuse is that um, uh, they did it because they wanted to defend themselves. Well, this was a peaceful flotilla. They had not gone to attack Israel. Uh, secondly, uh, Israel on the one hand claims that it has withdrawn all of its army from Gaza, which is true, but they have besieged Gaza. So if the Israeli army is out of Gaza, they cannot even use this argument that they are in a state of war against uh, the people of Gaza or the Palestinian people because they are no longer occupying Gaza, but they have besieged Gaza. So no matter which angle we look at it from the legal point of view, from the moral point of view, from the political point of view, uh, I'm afraid uh, Israel is on the wrong. And I think even their friends have now realized that Israel obviously has gone overboard. It has perpetrated uh, terrible crimes and these are unjustified and they cannot defend them. Even the U.S. government uh, felt that, in fact, uh, U.S. President Barack Obama said that the siege of Gaza is unsustainable and that it should be lifted. So we can see from that that obviously uh, this time uh, the Israelis went too far and they would obviously have to pay uh, a price for what they have done. So as we know, the humanitarian ship was a Turkish ship. So how has this crisis affected Israeli-Turkish relations? Well, obviously, um, uh, this attack on the uh, Turkish uh, ships, most of them were Turkish ships, um, apart from Rachel Khoury that was uh, actually um, rented uh, or, or bought over by uh, Ireland. Uh, but the majority of the ships or boats were, were Turkish. Uh, and uh, this has uh, deeply affected uh, Israeli-Turkish relations. Uh, in fact, um, the, the Israeli-Turkish relations are very long. Uh, Turkey was the first country in the Muslim world to recognize the state of Israel immediately after it was established. And as, a, as an immediate consequence of this attack, uh, Turkey did took several steps. Number one, it immediately withdrew its ambassador from Israel. Secondly, it canceled the military operations that were planned with Turkey. And the, the Turkish uh, president, Abdullah Gul, has said that our relations will never go back to what they were before. And it seems as if the present Turkish government uh, is more and more committed to alleviating the suffering of the people of Gaza. And, and uh, in fact, President uh, Erdogan, he himself said that uh, Turkish friendship is valuable, but uh, tr Turkish uh, enmity is also uh, very strong. And so if anybody uh, ventures in that direction that they will have to pay a very heavy price. So it seems to me that definitely uh, Israel has dealt a severe blow to Turkish-Israeli uh, relations and I don't think that they're going to get back to the, the same situation as they were before the May 31st, June 1st uh, attack on this flotilla in which uh, peaceful people were brutally attacked and murdered and uh, brutalized and this aid was prevented from reaching the Gaza Strip. So definitely it has dealt a severe blow to Turkish-Israeli relations, yes. You mentioned before that you believe Turkey is becoming continuously more supportive of the people of Gaza. Do you feel that Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan is actually serious about committing to this process? I personally believe that um, Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan is a very good man. Uh, he's a man of uh, principles. Uh, and he also has uh, his eye on his place in history. In fact, he already has um, uh, made history by the manner in which uh, he has conducted himself and um, made Turkey uh, more independent of foreign influence, particularly uh, American and Western influence. So I believe that definitely uh, as, as a very good man and, and as a very good Muslim, he feels deeply um, uh, grieved by the suffering of the people of Gaza and he wants to help them and he feels that uh, a great injustice is being perpetrated against the people of Gaza and that as a Muslim and as a great politician uh, he and a statesman he feels duty bound that he should help them so in that sense I believe that definitely uh, he is very sincere in this and in fact one can see from that that uh, he has uh, moved uh, Turkey to uh, establish close relations with a number of Arab countries like uh, uh, 
a, a couple of weeks after this attack on the flotilla, uh, he signed an agreement with Syria, Jordan and Lebanon to create a uh, free trade zone and uh, in fact lift um, restrictions on trade and visas between their countries which is a very significant move and secondly uh, Erdogan has moved to establish even closer relations with Iran on wi with which it shares a border uh, and in fact he was instrumental in facilitating this um, nuclear swap deal with Brazil and Turkey and Iran so we see that he is moving ahead and he is in fact um, taking on the role of a leading statesman in the Muslim world. So in that sense, obviously, uh, helping the people of Gaza would enhance his stature. And I believe that he is sincere in doing that. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing your insight with us on this highly contentious issue. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'm Afifa Khawaja for Crescent International's Global Forum. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Afifa Khawaja and welcome to Crescent International's Global Forum. June 12th marked the first anniversary of Iran's presidential elections. Last year there was much controversy about it. What happened on the anniversary this year? Well, really not much, uh, although, you know, in, in the Western media and some Western politicians, particularly the Americans, were hoping that there will be riots and chaos, etc. And uh, in fact, when nothing happened, um, uh, Hillary Clinton, the U.S. Secretary of State, even uh, issued a statement saying that it's regrettable that the opposition leaders actually cancelled uh, their, their demonstrations, etc. So in that sense, uh, everything went off peacefully. and. Um, the people of Iran went about their business because they are the ones that really support uh, Ahmadinejad. Does President Ahmadinejad really receive that much popular support? Oh, absolutely. I think what we need to understand is that uh, there are several things about him uh, that make him very popular with the people of Iran. The first thing is that he leads a very, very simple and humble life. Secondly, in his first term as president, he made sure to visit each and every village in Iran. And he has done tremendous amount of good work for the ordinary people of Iran. So it is the ordinary people naturally that are supporting him. They constitute the majority. Uh, regrettably, the kind of image that we get in the West, and that's deliberately distorted, that they try to project uh, that when there are some demonstrations which normally take place in major cities, that that is projected as if the rest of the country is also of a similar uh, mindset. But that's not the case. If one goes to the villages of Iran, one finds a lot of support uh, among ordinary people for President Ahmadinejad because they see him as one of them. Uh, he has helped the, the pensioners a great deal, he has helped the women, he has helped uh, you know, as students and young people. So in that sense, he really has a very, very broad-based support in Iran, yes. We know of Iran's recent nuclear deal with Turkey and Brazil. Could you please give us some insight into that deal? Now, that deal was uh, something of a master stroke by Iran in the sense that um, the Americans and the West were pushing Iran to uh, agree to a nuclear swap deal, which meant that um, Iran's uh, low-grade uh, uranium, which was about enriched to 3%, should be handed over, and then uh, the West would agree to provide uh, enriched uranium to be used in um, uh, Iran's medical research reactor, these isotopes that will be provided. Uh, but the sticking point was that the Iranians wanted this swap to be done simultaneously because they do not trust uh, Western governments. And the West, of course, said, no, you first give us your fuel and we will reprocess it and then hand it over to you. And that is something that Iran was not prepared to do. So through the help of Turkey and Brazil, 
uh, Iran made this deal and it agreed to precisely the terms that the West was looking for and said, okay, we will hand you over our fuel, but it will stay in Turkey until we get the enriched uranium uh, into our hands. So Iran sort of made a goodwill gesture uh, and that of course caught the US uh, on the wrong foot because this is exactly what the US wanted and in fact later on the uh, Brazilian president uh, Lula da Silva actually released a, the, the text of the letter that he had received from uh, US President Barack Obama dated April the 20th in which o Obama had said precisely what the deal actually achieved and yet then perhaps it appears that under uh, pressure from the right wing and the new cons in the United States that the Americans uh, reneged on that uh, agreement that they had uh, already or the green light that they had given to Turkey and Brazil. So what Iran has done is to show its goodwill and expose American duplicity in the process. And uh, uh, another important factor that emerges out of this is that now other countries like Turkey and Brazil and perhaps China and India are beginning to feel and find that America is really not a superpower anymore and that it cannot dictate. So I think that in itself is a very good development in global affairs. Thank you very much for your insight on this topic. Thank you all for watching our program. For Crescent International's Global Forum, I'm Afifa Kawaja.